Today I'm going to be explaining the how, the what, the why of NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. You need to have a basic understanding of what's happening to the nuclei of hydrogen atoms and carbon-13 atoms and molecules when we drop them into a magnetic field, how a spectrum is produced from this experience, and what the spectrum can tell us about the structure of the molecule. As always, we're going to start with something familiar. And that something familiar is the idea that electrons possess an intrinsic quantum property known as spin. We can visualise this by thinking of electrons as spheres, and they're able to either spin in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction around the axis. When we were looking at electron configuration, so if I took a lithium atom for example, lithium has three electrons, two in the 1s orbital and one in the 2s orbital. And for the electrons in the 1s orbital, we saw that in order to minimise repulsion, they would spin pair, is how we described it. So this idea that one electron be spinning clockwise and the other anti-clockwise. Now it turns out that neutrons and protons in the nucleus of an atom also possess this intrinsic quantum property of spin. And if protons and neutrons possess spin, then so must atomic nuclei. Certain atomic nuclei are magnetically active because they have an unpaired proton and neutron. In fancy quantum speak, we say that they have a nuclear magnetic spin quantum number of mi equals plus a half or minus a half. So this stood for nuclear. Magnetic spin quantum number and the plus half and minus half just denotes whether the nuclei are spinning in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. There's absolutely no difference in energy between these two nuclei. Examples of magnetically active nuclei include hydrogen and carbon-13. Hydrogen, because it has an unpaired proton, or well, hydrogen nucleus is simply a proton, so by nature of it, it's going to be unpaired. Carbon-13, well, it's got six protons, but it has seven neutrons. Six of those neutrons can pair up, but the final one is always going to be unpaired. Magnetically active nuclei generate a small magnetic field when they spin. And if we take these atomic nuclei and place them in an external magnetic field, this will cause the magnetic field of the spinning nuclei to align either with the external magnetic field or against it. Now, the nuclei that were spinning clockwise have a slightly lower energy than the nuclei that were spinning anti-clockwise. If we then irradiate our sample with radio waves, and radio waves have got a frequency of energy matching delta E, the difference between our two energy levels, remember delta E equals HV, where H is Planck's constant, and V is the frequency of the radiation, Energy is absorbed and nuclei are promoted from the lower spin state to the higher one. So we have this going on. Energy is given out when the nuclei return to the ground state. And this energy can be detected by a radio frequency receiver. The energy is mainly absorbed by the solvent. The amount of energy that has to be absorbed for a nucleus to move from the lower spin state to the higher spin state is specific to that nucleus. So no surprises there. Delta E for a hydrogen nuclei is going to be different to that for carbon-13. However, it turns out that not all hydrogen nuclei or carbon-13 nuclei in a molecule experience exactly the same magnetic field. 
So they don't all absorb the exact same frequency of radiation or energy to come into resonance. What are we saying? Well, what we're actually saying is that the magnetic field experienced by a nucleus is not exactly equal to the external magnetic field applied to the sample. When we place our nuclei into the external magnetic field, a local magnetic field is induced by the electron cloud that is circulating the nucleus. And this local magnetic field opposes, i.e. is in the opposite direction to the external magnetic field. So our nucleus here is essentially shielded by the circulating electron cloud. And the extent of this shielding depends on the exact position of the nucleus in the molecule. Let's take ethanol as an example of our sample molecule. Well, in ethanol, we have got three different types of hydrogen nucleus or proton. We're going to compare these two. This proton here is bonded to an oxygen. Oxygen is known to be electron withdrawing. It pulls electron density away from the proton. So it's going to experience a greater external magnetic field and the amount of energy it takes to be absorbed for this nucleus to jump from the lower to the higher spin state, delta E, is going to be greater than, for example, this proton over here. It's bonded to a carbon atom. We've got no electron withdrawing um, shenanigans going on. So the amount of energy it takes to promote it from the lower to the higher spin state is going to be less. It is more shielded from the external magnetic field. Because delta E for each of these two nuclei is different, and we know that delta E equals HV, when these nuclei drop back from the higher to the ground state, and they give out a pulse of radiation, these two pulses of radiation are going to be of a different frequency to each other, which means that on our spectrum, we would see two different signals. So an NMR spectrum shows a number of signals that tell us how many different environments there are for either our hydrogen nuclei or our carbon-13 nuclei in the molecule. And we can use this information to piece together a structure. This is the carbon-13 NMR spectrum for ethanol. The first thing that we need to explain is our horizontal axis. It's not in terms of delta E or even frequency. It's in units of parts per million for this term chemical shift. It turns out that the absolute value of delta E for different nuclei is not important. And each signal or peak, and here are my two signals, each of these is in reference to a standard, and the standard that's been chosen is TMS. Tetra methyl silane, an inert, non toxic solvent which is easily removed from the sample due to its volatility. It has the structure of a silicon atom bonded to four methyl groups. And the symmetrical arrangement of these methyl groups means that we've got 12 hydrogen nuclei, all strongly shielded, giving a unique signal, which is assigned a chemical shift of zero on our scale. Similarly, the four carbon atoms are equivalent. They're all in the same chemical environment, so they give one strong signal, also assigned a chemical shift of zero. The carbon-13 NMR spectrum shows us that there are two distinct carbon atom environments in ethanol. First of all, if we take this carbon atom here, this carbon atom here is directly bonded to an oxygen. 
So it's going to be less shielded from the external magnetic field and we would expect it to give a signal to a higher chemical shift. We can look up the chemical shift for different environments for both carbon-13 nuclei and hydrogen nuclei on a data sheet. And when we do so, we find that we would expect it to giving us a signal with a chemical shift in the range of 50 to 90 parts per million. So we can assign this peak or signal to this first carbon atom. This carbon atom here is not bonded to another oxygen, it's bonded to a carbon. And on the data sheet, the chemical shift for the signal would be expected to be in the range of 0 to 50 parts per million. So this signal or peak here on the spectrum must be due to the presence of that particular carbon atom. The proton NMR spectrum for ethanol has three signals. This is telling us we have got three distinct proton environments in our molecule. Now, the height of each peak, or technically the area under each peak, is proportional to the number of nuclei in each environment. And this information is collated and presented in terms of an integration curve. Although at A level, things are much more simple because they simply write the number of protons in each environment above the signal. So let's link our spectrum back to our molecule. Well, starting with this proton here, this proton is directly bonded to oxygen. It's going to be the least shielded and experience a larger external magnetic field. And when we use the data sheet, we see that we would expect a chemical shift with a peak in the range of 0 0.5 to 12 parts per million. And we can link it down to this small peak here, um, also because we have the information knowing that there's just one proton in that particular environment. If we take this proton here, and this one, and this one, these three protons are in the same chemical environment. They're all part of the same methyl group. So they are going to be the most shielded in terms of ex their experience of the external magnetic field. And on the data sheet, we would expect a signal in the range of 0 0.5 to two parts per million. So we can link those protons to this signal here. And then finally, we have got these two protons. They are both bonded to a carbon that's bonded to an oxygen. And when we look up the chemical shift we'd expect for these sorts of proton on a data sheet, we would expect a signal in the range of 3 to 4.2 parts per million. So we can link them, slightly messy spectrum, to this signal here. In the next couple of videos, I'm going to do a deep dive into how we interpret proton NMR spectra, carbon-13 NMR spectra, and how this information can be used to piece together the structures of unknown molecules. We're also going to explain why it is that these peaks here are split. If this has been useful to you, then hit the like button and please subscribe. It makes a huge difference to a small channel like us. And in the blurb below, you'll find a link to the website where there are detailed notes and exam questions and all sorts of other really useful stuff to help you with your A-level studies. I look forward to seeing you soon.